Good evening. <laughs> you know, I was going to tell a story about um, middle and high school, and I didn't know my parents were going to be here tonight, so then I was like, I don't even know how much hyperbole I can use or get away with. Um, growing up, I was a great math student, and you're going to have to believe me because I'm going to give you information that might say the exact opposite of that pretty soon. But from grades one through seven, I was a great math student. I really was, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You can give me three or four numbers, in, like give me in the thousands and I can figure it out pretty quickly. I was like straight A math student, all the way first grade up until seventh grade. And then eighth grade came and my teacher, I, I, I went into what I thought was math class, but she started writing letters on the board. <laughs> And I was like, I thought this was math class. And I struggled through eighth grade math, and then I got into high school, and in high school I had a really hard time. And the way that the high school math classes that I took at least worked was that the first two weeks, I could get everything. They made it so simple. They made it so easy to, to step into it that you could figure it out. I, I was totally tracking with it. And then I would show up in day one of week three, and they would start speaking a different language and they'd start doing things that I had no idea and I'd look around the room and everybody else in the room knew exactly what they were talking about. Everybody except for me. And so my teachers looked at me and they saw how hard I was trying. I started coming in three to five mornings a week for extra math help. I did that for most of my high school career. Uh, and they, they saw how hard I was trying and they saw how bad I was doing. And so they put me into a math class called Algebra A, which is where they take Algebra 1 and they slow it down half speed so that you can do it over two years. And I still got Fs and Ds and I kept coming in for extra help and I was just really bad in math. And so people tried to be supportive of me. People tried to tell me, you know, do, do you remember this in, in high school? People would say, oh, you're not good at algebra. That's okay because some people are algebra people. And some people are geometry people. So don't worry, once you get to geometry, you're gonna be totally fine. Nope, I was not fine. <laughs> Everything got worse when I went to geometry, algebra two, it was all terrible. I was not a good math student in high school. Which led me to this, it, it leads me to when my kids ask, ask me like, are you good at math? Can you help me with math? I don't exactly know how to answer. I mean, I can help them right now because they're young, but the time's going to come pretty soon where I won't be able to help them anymore. So I have these like dual voices in my life, these two different voices speaking to me about my identity with math. There's this first voice that developed when I was young and this second voice that developed when I was older. And so I had this question, which voice is actually true? Which voice is true? And as you and I go through our lives, we learn to operate in the world by listening to what I'm going to present as three different voices in our life to determine what's actually true about us. The first voice is a voice of judgment. It's a voice of self-judgment. It's a voice that's there from our youngest age. It's a voice that tells us this word, I am who I see in the mirror. That's what it tells us, that I am who I see in the mirror. That we communicate something by the clothes that we wear, by the style that we portray, by the personality that we exhibit, that there's something that we see. We don't have to do anything else. It's just what we see in each other physically. And there's this ancient voice in us. There's this innate voice. There's this first voice. It's a voice that's not true, but it tells us that I am who I see in the mirror, or I am what I accomplish. And this voice is really strong when we're young, but I don't think we ever really grow out of this voice. You know, I remember in middle and high school, uh, think back, if you can think back all the way to middle and high school, uh, do you remember the clothes that you wore in middle and high school? I specifically remember the three brands of clothing that people who were cool wore. And you probably remember it too if you're around my age. The cool people wore Abercrombie and Fitch, Gap, 
or American Eagle. And we, we didn't really wear that stuff too much uh, in, in my family. Uh, but I would go to the mall and look at the prices for some of those basic t-shirts. And they were like $50 for a t-shirt. But that's what people wore when I went to school. And you knew that you were cool because you wore those things. It's that basic drive that's in all of us. That voice that says, I am who I portray myself to the world. So who am I? Well, that first voice that speaks to us is a voice of self-judgment that tells me if I'm good enough or not. And many of us have struggled with this voice our whole entire lives. It's a voice that for far too many of us has plagued us. It's a voice of shame. It's a voice of self-condemnation. It's a voice that tells us to hide. And not all of us struggle with it to the extent that some of us do, but I think all of us have experienced this first voice. So if that first voice is an inner voice that's been most of us, that, that's been with, with us for most of our lives, the second voice is similar, but it's on the outside. It's a voice that speaks to us. It's a voice that says, I am what other people say that I am. I am what other people say that I am. The words that we speak to one another are so powerful, they cut deep. Most of us can hear a thousand compliments, but what will we remember? The one voice of critique. So back in college, when I was 18, I started writing this album. This song came to me all of a sudden. I remember it in my dorm room. It was a song about a spider. But it was weird because it was a song song from the perspective of a spider, which I thought was kind of odd. And as I went through college, I started getting more songs. This is just the way... Things tend to happen for me, written from other animals' perspectives. Like, I wasn't even trying, and then I'd go around in life. This is true, by the way. I'd go on walks at night, and I would, like, kind of run into the animals that I was writing about, specifically the fox. That was the one that always resonated with me. So I'd start seeing them. This really cool experience, I wrote this whole album called The Forest. It it was over a three-year period. And my friends and I, uh, we worked on it in the summer of 2008 when I was a junior in college. And uh, we made the album, we put on shows, my friends made costumes, and they did all sorts of artistic stuff. Uh, My brother wrote a short story for it. This really cool concept album called The Forest. Each song written from the perspective of a different forest creature. Well, so that album went out to the world, of course. Not that many people listened to it, but some people actually, surprisingly, all around the world did listen to it. And I got some reviews on the album, and I hadn't thought about this in over a decade. But this week, as I was thinking about this, I I said, I'm going to try to find the reviews of this album. And so I did. I I went back, I found this one particular review that was longer. And it's amazing. There's like 47 comments on it from people all around the world, and almost all of them are like overwhelmingly positive. And when I listen to it now, I'm like, oh gosh, I would change so many things about it. They were so much more positive than I remember. But the whole article that was written on it, again, was almost completely positive. But there's two lines that stuck out to me. You ready? Here's the first one. It's a slightly ridiculous concept album. <laughs> that, was, that was the first line <laughs> that really stuck out to me. The second, the second one was this. It was, for an, for an album with such lofty aspirations, the forest ultimately doesn't quite fulfill the promise of the concept. And, and let me be clear, the whole review was just so positive. He was trying to just give me a couple of small critiques that were really pretty minor, but those were the things that I remember. It wasn't the the voice of affirmation. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's that loved one that maybe it was when we were a child that spoke to us in a way that we still remember. Or maybe it was somebody that we went to school with that spoke to us in a way where those words still reverberate in our head. We can still hear them. And it's why scripture so vehemently talks about the words that we use. Here's what it says in Proverbs 16:24. It says, Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. In other words, our words can wound deeply, but they can heal deeply as well. It's this second voice that comes from people outside of us. And the temptation for us is to say that I am who other people say that I am. 
that's who I am. But there's more than just what people say about me, and there's more than just what I see in the mirror. We all know that there's also our personality, this unique God-created, God-designed personality. As I've been hearing more and more people's stories, getting to know so many of you over the years, even in, in my life, in church especially, but as I get to know people, I'm more convinced of this. There's nobody like you. And I genuinely mean that. As I get to know people, I get to see the beauty in every single person that I meet. It's absolutely amazing because God gave us these unique personalities. And so there's this third voice that speaks to us that I am who I discover myself as being. I I am who I discover myself as being, that there are these things about myself that I don't even know yet, but I'm in a process of discovering. So there's this first voice that says that I am what other people say that I am. And this second voice that I am who I see in the mirror, or I am who I am on the outside. But there's this third, deeper voice that we explore as we get older that talks about discovering who each of us are. But the problem is that it's becoming harder and harder to do that. There's actually all kinds of research on this now today. There's a whole field of research on this today that talks about how young people, people about my age and younger, are having a really hard time figuring out who they are. They're having a really hard time figuring out that third voice. So researcher Jeffrey Jensen Arnett, he spent his whole entire career looking into the way that this is taking longer and longer for young people to figure out, who am I? How do I figure out who I am? It's actually taking so long that researchers have had to come up with a whole new category, a whole new definition of this phase of life. It's for people age 18 to 30, and it's now called late adolescence. You're considered late adolescence in the, in the most modern research if you're in age 18 to 30. Here's just a little snippet of what Arnett says. He says, for the young Americans of the 21st century, the road to adulthood is a long one. They leave home at age 18 or 19, but most do not marry. Most do not become parents or find a long-term job until at least their late 20s. And from their late teens to their late 20s, they explore the possibilities available to them in love and work and move gradually towards making enduring choices. Such freedom to explore different options is exciting. And this is a time of high hopes and big dreams. However, it's also a time of anxiety because the lives of young people are so unsettled and many of them have no idea where their explorations might lead. They struggle with uncertainty, even as they revel in being freer than they ever were in childhood or will ever be once they step fully into adulthood. To be a young American today is to experience both excitement and uneasiness, wide open possibility and confusion, new freedoms and new fears. End quote. Because we live in a world in which we define our identity by what I see in the mirror and that could change. And by what people say about me, and that could change. And by what I could discover about myself, and if we're honest, we might not even figure that out either. And it all feels like shifting sand that Jesus talked about at the end of his sermon on the mount. And so the question for us tonight is simple. Is there a better way Why don't you open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. It says this, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, Make straight paths for him. So John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist 
and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just, just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. So who was Jesus? It means everything to figure out who we are as well. Who was Jesus? I think the temptation for us, I know this is my temptation, it's to believe that Jesus hovered two inches off the ground and floated everywhere he went and waved a wand and healed people. And yet we open up scripture and that's not at all who Jesus was, was it? I'm going to read this short little passage from the book of Hebrews that reminds us of who Jesus was. It says, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. He had to be made like them, fully human in every way. Paul in Philippians, in that famous passage in chapter 2, that, that old hymn, he, he puts it this way. He says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus was in his very nature God, but as Philippians says, he, he set aside all of those advantages and walked as a human being. I mean, genuinely as a human being. Even, even, even though he was God, he set it aside and walked as a human being. But there was something different about him. So what was it? It was his relationship. It was his relationship. God speaks into Jesus' life in this moment to proclaim to those around him and to Jesus himself, you are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. British theologian, author, N.T. Wright, he puts it this way. He says that the gospel writers start here by speaking of Jesus in these terms, and then they'll spend the rest of the gospel trying to convince you that you also are God's beloved. Isn't that amazing news? This is the good news about the coming of Jesus, that yes, he's different. There's something different of him, but he's also like you. He's human like you. He felt the pain and the rejection that you do, the voices that we hear that define us. He also heard voices and Jesus means, meets all kinds of people who are listening to all kinds of voices. People who are saying that, listen, I am just who I see in the mirror. I am who I portray myself on the outside to be. Think about all the Pharisees that Jesus met. Some of them were better than others. These were good, pious men, right? And Jesus also called them whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but it's a different story on the outside. He met people who were working off of that level. He met people who, who were working off of the level that I am what other people say about me. Think about the woman at the well, defined by what other people say about her. Think about the woman caught in adultery, defined by what other people say about her. Think about so many people in Jesus' ministry. Think about the tax collectors hiding afraid, defined by what other people say about them. And then he met other people who were defined by their own self-journey, of figuring out who they are. Think about his, his interaction with Pontius Pilate, philosophizing about the meaning of truth, 
the nature of the world. And Jesus steps into this process of identity formation. And it's not that he says that the whole thing's wrong. He just says that the whole thing is backwards. He says, you're starting in the wrong place. And we go out in life starting in the wrong place. And it's not our fault. But at a certain point, we have to wake up that our whole understanding of who we are is backwards. And then Jesus comes to John the Baptist as God incarnate, God in the flesh. And John recognizes this. There's this difference. John recognizes this special relationship that Jesus has to God the Father. You see, people came to John to receive a blessing. He said that they actually came to confess their sins and to be washed of their sins. And see, John recognized that there's a power that sin has over us. And when we confess it, It loses its power. We can confess it to each other and we can confess it to God. And John says, yeah, come and be baptized and I'll I'll baptize you with water and, and it'll wash you. It'll wash your skin. And then he looks at Jesus and he says, but there's somebody coming who could do something more. You see, the problem was people could go and get baptized by John, but then they could go about sinning again. He said, you have to become convinced of your belovedness be baptized in the Spirit. It's what we call conversion, becoming convinced of the fact that not only is Jesus God's beloved, but me. I'm God's beloved. Even though every other voice in the world tells me something different, when I look in the mirror, I don't see it. When I, when I hear the voices outside, I don't hear it. But when I look to Jesus, I believe it. Jesus says, you too, you too, are God's beloved. The Bible portrays, I love, well, you should know this. I love the Bible. (laughs) It says so many great things. It says that God created the world through Jesus. And John says that Jesus is love. That God created the world through creative love. He created you creatively, beautifully in love. You are the child who I love, and you live in a world that's created in love. But I'm telling you, we walk out in the world and hear all these voices, and there's very few people who believe that. And we look around the world and see the pain. It's very hard to believe. It's very hard to believe. And this is where Jesus pushes us. He looks to the sky sees heaven open. He sees a different reality happening. It's invisible to the naked eye, but that's why he kept talking about the kingdom and kept saying, for people who can see it, see it. For people who can hear it, hear it. What is it? The voice of love. It's in every single person. The invitation to every single person to come and be a part of this. So Jesus says those words. If you have eyes to see it, see it. If you have ears to hear it, hear it. I was always confused by that. Weren't you confused by that? But we get a little glimpse here in in Mark chapter 1. Let's look at verse 10 just real quickly. It says, Jesus came up out of the water. He saw heaven being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. It's this special moment of identity in Jesus's life. It's a moment where he heard God telling him what was actually true. Because listen, Jesus was about to hear a lot of voices that were not true. He was going to hear a lot. He was going to spend years hearing voices that were not true. Here's a couple things he was going going to hear. Can anything good come from Nazareth? He's a false prophet. He blasphemes God's name. He's demon-possessed. He's out of his mind. He saved others. Can't save himself. These are the voices Jesus was going to hear. And as you go out and live, you're going to hear those kinds of voices too that are going to try to get you to believe something about yourself that's not true. It's not true. Jesus invites you to see something that seems impossible, but it's more real than any of these voices. We need to learn to hear that truth again and again, because the voice that you listen to 
will define you. It'll define you. So what are you listening to? So where do we go from here? What do we do with this? Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus reminded himself daily. Now, if there was one person that I would think could get away with not having to remind himself of his identity, I would say, it's Jesus, wouldn't you? And yet he doesn't cut the corners. What does Jesus do? He spends time with God, reminding himself, praying to God, giving himself to God, saying, let me be a conduit of your love. He had this special relationship with God, but yeah, he put it aside to show us how to do it too, to spend time reminding ourselves. There's this counterintuitive way that this happens, and this is what I'm going to leave us with tonight, because we're, we're probably thinking, well, what in the world? How do I do this? It's the last couple of verses that we're going to read tonight. It says this uh, in verse 12 and 13, at once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Because our beliefs go only as deep as we've been tested. Our beliefs go only as deep as we've been tested. In fact, the tests that we are going to go through in life prove what it is we truly believe. You know, in the Old Testament, there's this story about this man named Job whose life was a testimony to this reality. There was this belief in his day, and it's still present in our day, that God loved you if you were good. And if you were good, God loved you. If you sin, you're bad, and God will give you a disease or make you poor. And if you do good, God will reward you. And Job's friend remind him of this because he's a rich man who had everything and lost everything. And so they say, Job, you must have done something bad. And he says, no, I swear, I didn't do anything bad. And they go on for about 40 chapters with this <laughs> because they had this false sense of who am I? Well, I'm loved if I do good things. If I do bad things, God will punish me. And God steps into the situation and says, the whole way you're seeing the world is backwards. You are loved. The way I tell my friends recently, as I've been growing in my relationship with God, and a lot of my friends struggling to grasp some of this, I, the only way I can explain it is I say, what I have experienced is that I live in a reality where I am loved and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I can't get away from it. I can't run away, even if I tried to. David talks about that, doesn't he? Where could I go from your presence? I couldn't run from it. I couldn't hide from it. And the testing, the testing ground is where you strengthen your resolve to believe it. To believe it. Job, he's tested for 40 chapters and he strengthens himself to believe it about himself. And Jesus strengthens his resolve through the testing to believe it about himself. To say, yes, I know who I am. Think about right before the cross in the garden. Strengthening his resolve again to believe it. And so that's what we enter into here as we enter into the season of Lent. This is really what Lent is all about. It can seem or it can feel like kind of a heavy season. And it's a season where oftentimes we give something up. But maybe we might see that in a little bit of a different light after this. I, I, I look at it actually as an opportunity to intentionally invite a time of testing so that I can strengthen my resolve to love Jesus more to follow Jesus more, to be with him more. And so that's our invitation um, for you tonight as well, as we enter into this Lenten season, um, that all these vo voices in our life are pouring in and hard to push out. But tonight, my prayer is that you would hear the voice of God, the invitation to know him more. You know, tonight we are going to take ashes. If, if you want to have ashes on your forehead, you can. Um, and we're also going to take the cup and the bread. And Brian's going to come up in just a few minutes and explain that. But tonight is a moment where we get to embrace the fact that we are human. 
that we are finite, but that we worship a God who is not finite and who loves us deeply. We have an opportunity to say yes to God, to agree with his proclamation over us that we are loved. Would you pray with me? Lord, maybe the hardest thing for us to do in life is to believe that we are capable of being loved by you. The hardest thing for us to do, Lord, we look at Jesus and his identity, who he is, and we, we look at his perfection. We look at the fact that you sent him as God incarnate. And we say, well, yeah, it makes sense, Lord, that you would love Jesus. But we, Lord, like the disciples, we, Lord, like the people who saw Jesus so often can't get over the walls that we create in our own life. And so tonight what we're praying for is that you would help us to surrender to that. You would help us to accept and to hear the words that you say about us, that we too are your beloved children. God, I pray tonight, um, just for every person in this room, I pray that we would have a clarity of mind that maybe you might even be spurring us to release something in our hearts, in our minds here. Before we take communion, Lord, I pray that um, even as we sit, we would have the audacity to confess something to you that we've been holding on our hearts. Lord, we trust that as we do that, we are creating a room to love you more. And so we pray that you come in, fill our hearts, give us wisdom and strength as we go forth from this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.